look at that suffering and to try and explain it away as just, well, they're human beings. I don't know, it doesn't really feel good enough to me. Once I stole the candy bar, I'm so bad. Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Uh, today I'm doing another Saints Unscripted reaction video. Uh, this video is on uh, prophet fallibility or prophetic fallibility. Um, so yeah, let's just get straight into it. And the spirit pierced my heart and he said, uh, he said do you condemn that 11 year old little, little kid for doing that? Or was he a bad kid? And I said, no, I wasn't a bad kid. I was just made a mistake. Yeah. And he said, do not condemn my servants for operating with limited light. And I was like, I can't condemn wow. Brother Brigham. I can't condemn Joseph. Um, they were operating with as much light as they had. And that's the key phrase, operating with as much light. So uh -huh. prophets see through glass darkly, you can say. There's all these other phrases in the scriptures that teach us to be humble about the beginnings of the church and where we are today. And also about other churches. I think other churches have beautiful rooms mm -hmm. that are being lit up. Mm -hmm. We're all headed towards Christ. All these beautiful churches are bringing Christ's light into um, the churches, and we have a very beautiful room that's becoming more and more light filled. Hello, guys. Welcome back to Saints Unscripted. I'm Caleb. I'm Sabrina. And today we have a very special guest. Once Welcome. Again. Hello. hello. Uh, today we'll be talking about prophetic. Fallibility. 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 That's the word. I couldn't, couldn't think of it. Yes. Yeah. 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 And yeah. just talking about what it is, learning more. Uh, it's open discussion. So yeah, I don't. I don't know if this is like a news flash for you or like I can't believe you didn't know this, but prophets are not perfect. They're no. <laughs> just like us, they're human. Yeah. <laughs> just, just in case. Mind you blown. Know. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So yeah, we're, we're here to talk about it. Uh, I like to wrestle. That's what I do. I wrestle with these issues. I've been wrestling with these difficult issues for a while now in my life, my adult life. And so we need to be able to wrestle with this and see, you know, how can I sustain uh, when we have, we appear to be mistakes made by prophets. Um, don't wrestle with the prophets though, because they're weak. <laughs> well, over, no, don't wrestle with the prophets because they're older. That, that's <laughs> literally like, in my like, brain, like, I, was like, I was like, no, they're not weak, they're not weak, they're the strongest. Out of context. <laughs> they're um, older than me. Yes. But probably stronger, actually. And before we get started, we do need to say we have a challenge. So if we can get enough likes, on this video <laughs> or yeah or enough votes, votes for this for this we're gonna have rachel behind the camera be a part of an episode see but no one here cares so it's okay like, oh, <laughs> everyone, everyone everyone cares because you're the cares. you're the power behind okay, the camera yeah. anyway. so um, how many how many likes how many should we ask for uh 50 50 50 likes one like one like baby no, i say that's all we need 400 400 400. That's a fair goal. All right. Okay. Do you commit, Rachel? Yeah, 400 on this video. On this video, 400 likes, Rachel will be on this yeah. side of the camera. Okay, okay. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so I want to start off by asking uh, the two of you if you have any examples. Uh, just one is fine, but of a prophet in the Old Testament's easy, low hanging mm -hmm. fruit, right? Uh, if not, current prophets, whatever you'd like to do, but maybe you mention a, we would see maybe as a mistake made by a prophet. Do you have any examples? I guess the the big one that everyone knows is the story of Jonah. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. God say, "Hey, go here," and he's like, "No." Nah. And then, yeah. and then we Classic. all know what happens. He gets Slug. gobbled up. Yeah. Classic mistake. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. It feels kind of weird to um, compare contemporary LDS, or should I say, latter day LDS prophets, with Old Testament prophets because they feel to me like very different things. Um, you know, there's no Old Testament prophets that are powerful in the same way. There's none with lawyers. There's none with, you know, large budgets, etc. For the most part, Old Testament prophets tend to be, I don't know, kind of loner figures, you know, crying in the wilderness or baking their own poo even. Yeah, we're comfortable with saying that's a mistake, right? Yeah. It's clearly... 
he didn't uh, fall, follow and through. And there was a clear punishment. <clears throat> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. I think, see, okay, so I don't know if this one counts as a mistake, though, but I always just, like, it's it's very nuanced, very complicated, the whole story of Abraham and Isaac. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, like, I know that you can say it was so Abraham could understand what it would be like to have to... I think this whole topic of mistakes is kind of interesting. It feels very in the air at the moment, in our contemporary age, to go back through history and think about the wrongdoings of historic figures through our own kind of uh, contemporary moral framework. Um, you know, it brings to mind, for example, going back and looking at America's founding fathers and judging them for the fact that they were racists or they were slave owners even. And I don't know, there's something... I'm a, I'm a bit uneasy with that type of... Um, that kind of exercise. I guess I don't really see the point of it unless there are kind of um, contemporary effects of holding certain figures in uh, high esteem. Then I guess you could see why it would be appropriate to kind of bring them down a notch. You know, now that I live here in North Carolina, I'm very aware, for example, of, and this is obviously the case kind of throughout um, America, generally, is, you know, statues of questionable individuals or graves of questionable individuals that have been desecrated. And I don't know, I'm kind of uneasy with that lose your child and so it's like more of this connection to god but mm -hmm. i still feel like i mean from his from soraya's perspective like that mm. knowing like hey i just took my took my son up real quick to go kill him but i didn't so mm -hmm. like i don't know that'd be really hard for me as as her to yeah see as not a mistake yeah mm -hmm. so as you talk about this um you know do we feel a little uncomfortable saying because like it's like we're not supposed to judge, right? Past judgment, uh, yeah. especially on a prophet. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we're we're told that prophets aren't perfect, and so we need to be able to wrestle with what we see maybe our mistakes. And um, and we have, uh, you know, for example, there's some people that I know in the church today that have struggled with a few uh, recent uh, changes. Uh, for example, uh, we had this pandemic, and President Nelson encouraged us strongly to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. He even had a picture taken of him getting the vaccination, and I have some close members of the uh, friends of the church and, and the church who um, have really struggled with that, right? That they feel like that's not a prophet's role to encourage a vaccination. Um, and say that's interesting. I, I wasn't kind of aware of that, but that does kind of make sense. Cause of course um, here it's a very politicized, this issue in the United States um, and people on the right politically tend to be, um, opposed to vaccines or at least opposed to mandated vaccines and you would imagine that the lds church is predominantly republican and for the prophet to be mandating that that's kind of an interesting uh problem to run into they would probably consider that to be a mistake right and i and i don't personally but i'm just calling that out as someone that's watching probably would see that and we also have the 2015 exclusion policy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The trouble with, I don't know, the difficulty with calling these religious leaders <clears throat> um, individuals that are making mistakes, you know, to look back at Joseph Smith or to look back at Brigham Young and to take um, theological positions that they've taken, um, such as, you know, I don't know, some of the, the classic ones might be like polygamy. Right. You might think that polygamy was a mistake right from the get go or the exclusion of black people from the priesthood um, or the way women may have been treated historically or, or whatever it may be. To kind of look back at that and to say that that is wrong, that is to place ourselves in moral judgment of these individuals that came before us because we believe now that we are in a morally superior place and are therefore in a position to judge what they did as mistakes. I don't, I don't know. There's something 
There's something weird about that. You know, it's one thing to judge just some random um, historical figure for their um, racism or their slavery owning or whatever. But these are, you know, individuals with a hotline to God, right? So what does it mean if they are believing that God is telling them to operate in the world in this way that we now perceive as a problem? I don't know, that, that is problematic. Where children of, of gay or lesbian parents are unable to be baptized. And until they were 18. Right? Until they're 18. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that was considered by many as a mistake, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, we have this example, recent example of some uh, introduction of new, I guess, or clarifying a doctrine. So Elder Holland, he has, uh, has this little video you can find online if you just search for wrong roads. Mm-hmm. And him and his son, Matt, were on this uh, little out, you know, outdoor exclusion, uh, exclu- um, excursion. Excursion. <laughs> and uh, they were going, going back from this, uh, this camping trip or whatever, and they came to a fork in the road in their truck. And they prayed to know which way to go. They weren't sure which way. And so they prayed and they felt both inspired to go down a certain road, one mm-hmm. of the forks, and ended up being the wrong way. It was a dead end after a couple of miles. And uh, he wondered why the Lord would have inspired him to to do that when, um, you know, the Lord should be always guiding us towards the truth, right? That's the, yeah. the space. And especially when they both got the same right. confirmation. Yeah. So that kind of, I think, troubled him, wrestled with that topic, with that issue, and uh, came away with an idea that, well, the Lord will sometimes guide us down a wrong road uh, yeah. that will allow us to see quickly and clearly the right path, mm-hmm. right? So it's kind of an interesting uh, teaching, uh, doctrine in our church now that's been introduced, which I think is very helpful in understanding prophetic fallibility. We we uh, have this very idea. Because it makes everything, it makes everything that's come before kind of meaningless, right? Because it can all be judged by by contemporary cultural norms or... If you don't want to be too kind of uh, prescriptive with what is being judged, it allows um, individuals the liberty to decide for themselves what they think is a mistake. So, for example, you could imagine there might be a woman member of the LDS church that believes that the very idea that polygamy was ever allowed in the church to be a kind of... um, overreach of Joseph Smith's authority, right? That he was fundamentally wrong in doing that. And therefore, this kind of gives that woman the ability now to view that as a straight-up mistake. But, you know, where does ultimate authority lie then? Does it lie, does it lie with the, the church, with the prophets? Does it ally with... Um, the kind of moral arc of the universe? Does it lie just with the subjective discomfort of each individual person regarding the issue in question? Idealized view growing up in the church of how uh, prophets operate and how they are nearest to God of anyone on the earth and how they, when they speak, even like on the street, like, you know, they're walking on the street with their family. And if they were to talk to a stranger on the street, That is the word of God coming from the prophet's mouth at all times. And that kind of idealized view of prophets, I don't think that they even would espouse that or, 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 you know, promote that, Mm -hmm. that way of thinking of them. Um, So what are your thoughts? So it kind of reminds me as well of the distinction, which is made uh, regarding the Pope within Roman Catholicism. The Pope is not um, infallible regarding every single utterance that comes out of his mouth. He's only infallible within uh, Catholic theology when it comes to, um, you know, what is said within his role as the Pope. When he gives, you know, official papal decrees, that is regarded as infallible. But when he's, you know, ordering how he wants his eggs done in the morning, that's not infallible. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe we believe that prophets are like nearest to god than any people because they like are the head of the church on the earth but that doesn't mean that they are god in any way they are 100 percent human um they 
totally can make mistakes. God appointed them knowing that also, mm-hmm. and that we shouldn't. But isn't God the Father 100% human within LDS theology? Praise them in the way that we, or at all, honestly, right? And um, mm-hmm. I think that's like a really important thing. Just like remember that they are human and they are not God. And when they do make mistakes, that's not God making a mistake necessarily. So, mm-hmm. Right, right. So when the, I t- mentioned the policy of exclusion, right? Mm-hmm. That that could have been considered theologically a wrong road. We went down this wrong road where... We had to learn quickly that it was causing people pain and heartache. Yeah. And it was not the original intention of the prophets uh, was to, um, to you know, create a policy that would avoid heartache in the home. And so I think that's probably a good example of a wrong road. And, um, and so, you know, people that criticize the church and that are doubting the church and leaving the church, they would see something like that as proof that a prophet is not a prophet. Mm-hmm. But we need to be able to address that and say, no, the beauty of this rest- restored gospel is that the Lord can still bring a lot of power and beauty through this institution, through this church, into our lives, uh, through the church, and, uh, and it can be through imperfect people. I mean, I'm imperfect, and I, I feel the Lord does work through me yeah. in, in different times of my life. Yeah. So I'm trying to think that if God wanted... It's diff- I think when you're, when you're kind of um, thinking about the mistakes in your own life at a very subjective level, it's much easier. It can be much easier. I mean, I guess it kind of depends, but I think it can be easier to be gentle towards the individual, the more stupid individual who made stupid mistakes um, that was you as a child. That feels more difficult when we're talking about an entire institution, particularly an entire institution that may have caused a great deal of suffering to particular groups of people, whether they be women, whether they be uh, racial minorities, whether they be people within the LGBT community. To kind of look at that suffering and to try and explain it away as just, well, they're human beings. I don't know. It doesn't really feel good enough to me. This, his gospel, his world or church to be run with no faults at all, then why would he choose for a human to be? Trust men mm-hmm. yeah. and women to do it. Because yeah. just like with, I mean, like you think about like with children, with whatever. And especially given the restoration, uh, you know, the whole idea with Joseph Smith is he's looking around in his youth at all these denominations and he thinks to himself, well, which of these one is right? Well, none of them are right because God has revealed to me that all churches have kind of gone astray. And that's why there needs to be a restoration of the true church with a true doctrine. So again, how are you going to look at that? That's, you know, that's Joseph Smith being very clear about what he's doing and saying that, yeah, but this aspect here and this aspect here, given what we now know, is wrong. We all are going to make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Even when we're doing our absolute best and we mm-hmm. know better, we still will make mistakes. And so if he wanted to be perfect, then he would just lead it all by himself. And I think like, Another thing that I've been thinking of is that, yeah, we are all human and we all do make mistakes. And like, just to double down on that, all throughout like the Bible, New Testament, Old, Old Testament, um, the prophets had something like anxiety like Moses did or like in the latter days, um, President George Albert Smith had like severe depression and anxiety. Like they go through the same trials and stuff that we have just because they're prophet doesn't mean that they're untouchable, they're perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, and that they make faults. They have, they go through the same stuff that we do. They go through the same trials, mental illnesses, afflictions, everything Mm -hmm. that they go, like we go through. So like, I guess it's a silly idea in a way to like deify them or like see them as like this untouchable celebrity kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But that comes back to like natural man, like all throughout Old Testament, like Moses, the Israelites started worshiping the golden calf when he disappeared. Um, and even today, like, sure, we don't worship golden calves and that sort of stuff, but people still worship celebrities. People still think that, like, 
Andrew Garfield is untouchable. I don't know, like big yeah. name celebrities are like the most perfect people. Right. Mm-hmm. And I feel like in the church too that we kind of fall into that, worshipping like, not worshipping, but just like looking up to deifying like the leaders of the church, the Quorum of the Twelve, like even back home in Australia, um, people in my stake would like see the patriarch, the stakes patriarch as this massive celebrity and like, they would freak out whenever they realized that he was in the same ward together or like right yeah like we get the oogly eyes right yeah mm-hmm. the starstruck yeah uh, situation where you yeah. can't believe he's here in my presence yeah <laughs> like i think there's a difference between like honoring uh respecting appreciating mm-hmm. valuing and worship, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. We have to be able to distinguish all mm-hmm. these different... And we can definitely respect and honor someone, but I think Rachel, she, she mentioned the word congratulate. Mm-hmm. You know, I, when I was called... Uh, recently, I was called... Uh, well, recent. It feels like forever, but... Elders Quorum President, right? And I had a couple people come and say, hey, congratulations, <laughs> yeah, President Weiniger. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, boy. And I said, well, thank you for, you know, say, you know, saying thank you, appreciating people for mm-hmm. their service, I think is, is, is a good way to go. And, and you know, elevating people uh, for their, you know, for any things that they do that are good, I think is a misdirection. We need to be elevating, praising God, right? Mm-hmm. Praise Jesus. I say that all the time with my friend, close friends. I'm like, when people give me compliments uh, for whatever good things I'm doing, I was like, praise, praise Jesus. Because <laughs> I, yeah. I have ev- evangelical friends that I, mm-hmm. I've learned that phrase from. And I think there's, there's power in that. Like we can say that respectfully and, and return any, you know, I guess glory. You could say people are giving you glory, like honoring you. Mm-hmm. And you can return that, right? Mm-hmm. And I think the prophets are pretty good at that. They, they warn each other about adulation. You've heard uh, some of these anecdotes of, of them kind of talking to the new core member, like, hey, if you feel like people are, there's some adulation going on, people are, you know, giving, deferring to you, giving you a ton of extra respect and things, that can be poison to your soul. Mm-hmm. And so they know, and they avoid that, that feeling of, oh, I'm great. You know, right. and, they, and they're, they're really good at that. But Like ego adjusting. Right. Yeah. Okay, so we're talking kind of a lot about, like, the, be careful that we don't, like, praise and worship leaders of the church mm-hmm. or other, mm-hmm. I mean, anyone, any human, don't do that. And that also that there's times when, we can say something was a mistake, and then a lot of times those have been, like, already reconciled or, like, Correctly. made right. Um, for example, like, the exclusion, and then also, like, blacks and priesthood, like, right. all of these things. That was a long, wrong road, possibly, yeah. Yeah. potentially. Yeah. We, could, we could say there's a good historical research. The research has been done on the priesthood ban. It's pretty clear that, that it was a wrong road. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some people that believe it wasn't, and that's fine. You can re- believe what you want, but... A lot of us are saying, yes, that looks like it could have been a mistake. Yeah. yeah. See, that, it feels like it really does come down to that, this video. You can believe what you want. This video is about making you, as a member of the LDS church, feel comfortable within the church. And so whatever your own hang-up is, whatever you feel the church is erroring in, either historically or now... You're right to continue to hold that and just believe the church is incorrect. But then what do you do with that? I don't know. That feels very, that feels like a problem to me. But, okay, so now my question is what do we do when we feel like something is maybe qualified as a mistake, but doesn't yet have that correction? Mm, like and i think about or or even if it's not super like a huge policy but just maybe like uh something that was mentioned at some point in a general conference talk a long time ago and a lot of members have put that in their thoughts as like for example modesty or just like thinking about women in general like the roles that women have and Mm. their responsibility to be modest so that the men are not tempted like that sort of thing is not necessarily like a straight up doctrine but it's you know, been said in situations where members have put that on, like, that's, that's what it is. That's how it is. It's Mm -hmm. like, how do you kind of go about dealing with those things? And So, so yeah, this time, this will go and tie into my, I say my vision. I had a vision basically. (laughs) And I hate to saying stuff like that in public, but it's true. Like, I just can't deny what happened to me. So I was wrestling with this topic and this will answer your question, but in kind of a long way. So, so I was wrestling with prophetic fallibility and, um, 
the, my mind opened up and I saw this large dark room, right? It opened up in an expansive room. It was huge, like a, like an enormous warehouse, like the biggest warehouse that I've you've ever been into. And this warehouse, this huge room was filled with beautiful things, like stuff like uh, you'd find in the celestial room of mm -hmm. the temple, right? Yeah. Like beautiful couches, mirrors, paintings, mm -hmm. all these things. Chandeliers. Stuff that, have, yeah, chandeliers, mm -hmm. but it was, it was all dark. Okay. And I was like, oh, that's unfortunate. And then I saw um, Joseph Smith and Emma. And they came forward in the darkness. And then I saw the Savior appear and gave them each a little candle and said, here you go. And I'm going to light these candles and go forward and light the room. And it was a very humble, humbling experience for me to see. Like, wow, this is very, you know. And I, I was reminded of the scripture in uh, DNC 1, I think it's 30, out of dark, uh, obscurity and darkness. And you can look that up and maybe post it for us on that mm -hmm. video. But I, I was reminded of that scripture, like out of d obscurity and darkness that the Lord is restoring this church. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. And I saw Joseph and Emma Smith go forward. Um, through this room and light a few areas of the room, um, humbly, you know, stumbling through the dark, tri tripping and falling over different things, not understanding things. There is something kind of strange about this move as well. This kind of um, need that in order to uh, give your own subjective feelings legitimacy, you need to couch it in religious language you know it's not enough for you to say that oh, i was thinking about this and you know these individuals were of course um limited and only received grace up to a, a certain extent and therefore we need to you know recognize their limitations now it's not enough just to make that kind of observation you need to be able to say that i had a vision in which you know, it's as if the, the God has revealed to me that this insight is um, worthy of me as a member of the LDS Church. And therefore, it's worthy of you to think this as well. Almost a kind of sacred elevation of fallibility. Doing the very best, making some mistakes. And then I saw Brigham and all the other prophets receive their candles. And Brigham, of course, you know, we could say he probably tripped over some stuff and also maybe lit a few things on fire. You know, I don't know. Brigham, I love you. And if you're listening, uh, I know you've repented of things, maybe the mistakes you made. But I think he probably could have, you know, he probably could have lit some things on fire in mm -hmm. that room and made some big mistakes. Right. But he also did a lot of good. and He, made, he lit some uh, other parts of the room. And so and, and then I saw today's uh, leaders in the church and they have now are operating in this room with greater light. There's more light, but there's still rooms, still areas of this room, pockets of this room that are still in darkness. Mm -hmm. And I saw that. And the Lord reminded me, I had a flashback in that vision to when I was uh, uh, like 11 years old. And I broke some windows with some friends in this construction site. Oh. And I went along with the group and I threw these rocks in these gorgeous big glass windows, this huge building. And it was fun and it was exciting. And I was like, I'm part of this group. And I went home and I didn't tell my parents about it. Uh -huh. And I, no one knew. And a couple years later, my mom said, you're going to go out to uh, dinner with your dad tonight. And I was okay. No, you're not thinking about it. I was like, special time with my dad. And in the drive, I remember exactly where I was. And I was sitting in the seat next to my dad. My dad's like, hey, uh, so did you ever break some windows a few years ago? <laughs> and I'm like, and I was like, uh, how did you know about that? <laughs> and I was so ashamed and so felt so much guilt in that moment. It is funny as well, whenever, um, not entirely, but for the most part, when individuals on Saints Unscripted make kind of confessions of past sins, they're always so innocuous. <laughs> they're always kind of on the level of, once I stole the candy bar, I'm so bad. It's like, yeah, uh, your mom was talking with your old uh, friend's mom, and in passing, she was like, hey, remember when our kids broke those windows? My mom was like, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what did my son do? Oh, she had no yeah. idea because I'd hidden the truth. And the spirit pierced my heart and he said, uh, he said do you condemn that 11-year-old little, little kid for doing that? Or was he a bad kid? And I said, no, I'm not, I wasn't a bad kid. I was just made a mistake. Yeah. And he said, do not condemn my servants for operating with limited light. 
And I was like, I can't condemn wow. Brother Brigham. I can't condemn Joseph. Um, they were operating with as much light as they had. And that's the key phrase, operating with as much light. So uh -huh. prophets see through glass darkly, you can say. There's all these other phrases in the scriptures that teach us to be humble about the beginnings of the church and where we are today. And also about other churches. I think other churches have beautiful rooms mm -hmm. that are being lit up. Mm -hmm. We're all headed towards Christ. All these beautiful churches are bringing Christ's light into um, the churches. And we have a very beautiful room that's becoming more and more light-filled. So that's my vision. Wow. And I think my so savior sense. for that yeah. beautiful vision. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. I think we should end it on that. that yeah, that was a perfect seal. That's really cool. Okay. Thanks, guys. All right, well... Thank you for joining us from this conversation. Yeah. Um, I bet you also have sometimes felt like things are mistakes or don't make sense and maybe that. Uh... Okay, well, thanks for watching, guys. So, subjectivity is king. I suppose that's the message of this video. That if it feels like a problem to you, then it probably is. Because you're probably right. And also allowing for the beautiful rooms of other churches. Allowing for the fallibility, the mistakes of all those other believers. It's almost as if what you believe doesn't matter at all. Just as long as you have love in your heart, just as long that you're in lockstep with what culture today tells us is right. Hmm. Okay, well, I don't really know what to do with that. Thanks for watching, everyone. Maybe you could... Uh, Leave me a comment below. Tell me what you think about um, all of this. Uh, please do subscribe to the channel. Uh, it does help me out. Most viewers um, that watch this channel are not subscribers. Um, so it would be useful uh, for the algorithm for me to kind of make sure it gets into people's um, YouTube feeds. If you did subscribe and did hit the bell. Uh, cheers for watching and uh, please do check out another one of the videos. Thanks again and I'll see you in the next one.